So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on occupied land. Um, this land was originally inhabited by these different tribes, um, specifically where we are, the Tonkawas, Karankawas, and Coahuiltecans, but also the Kados, Lipan Apaches, Humanos, and Comanche um, were all living here before Westerners settled um, Texas. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone that made this symposium possible, not just the organizers, but also the people who cleaned and prepared this room, these halls, this building, so that we could be here today, because their liberation is bound up in our liberation. My name is Doctora Nicole Estefania Cabrera Salazar, and I'm here to talk to you about retaining people of color in astronomy. Now, I am not going to use any science today. We're not going to look at graphs or plots um, or data. Um, and I'll tell you why. There's something called traditional or indigenous knowledge. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of how legitimate they are, um, even though we try to adhere to Western ideas of what is legitimate information. So for example, um, indigenous people knew that, or, or believed that suffering is passed down from generation to generation for thousands of years, and only now are we catching up with Western science uh, validating this through the telomeres, which are the end caps of our chromosomes. Um, and so we have Western science validating something that indigenous people have known for a very long time. Another example is yoga. Um, so yoga has been practiced for literally thousands of years um, and when the British invaded India they prohibited people from practicing it and dismissed it as you know spiritual mumbo-jumbo and only now is Western science catching up to the power that it has uh, that yoga has physiologically mentally it's one of the five factors that has been scientifically proven quote-unquote um, to intervene with depression and anxiety so I'm okay with using my traditional knowledge to bring to you this information that, that I have for you today. And um, just to show you, this is a picture of me when I was two years old in 1989. Um, so I'm aging myself here, but um, this was the year that I came to the United States as an immigrant from Chile. And you can tell because of my um, Mickey Mouse sweatshirt. Um, this is the girl that I dedicated my PhD dissertation to. And I'm gonna read this to you um, so that everyone can, can hear what this says. This dissertation is dedicated to my past self, a brown immigrant girl who did not know that she could be a scientist, but whose mother insisted that no barrier could prevent her from realizing her dreams. I honor that young girl's potential, grit, and determination. But most of all, her integrity in the face of those who would cruelly and persistently stand in her way. This dissertation is her legacy, an impossible achievement in a world not built for people like her. If you are a brown girl reading this, it is also for you, to show you that you are both worthy and capable of attaining the highest goals, that your ancestors have thrived even if our stories are not told. So if you are not a brown girl in this room, what is the connection to you? Um, in 2016, I gave um, a presentation at South by Southwest, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It kind of stops traffic and, and everything downtown for a few days uh, in March. And I, uh, this is a picture of me being interviewed for the Stuff Mom Never Told You podcast, if any podcasters are in the room. And I gave a presentation on science sexism in um, how to fight science sexism with technology, with social media. And you know, we, we presented this panel, and at the end of the panel, I got a question from a young man who said, you know, my, uh, my girlfriend is a scientist, and she struggles with imposter phenomena, and she has a lot of self-doubt. Um, do you have any advice for me on how I can help her when she, you know, she's feeling that way? And I said, um, you know what, my husband um, is a white man, able-bodied, upper middle class, every privilege you could possibly imagine. And we have the same conversations. And so what I would say to you is uh, you need to educate yourself. Um, you need to read about all the struggles that your girlfriend is facing every day. And you need to understand fundamentally what these things are, not by asking her, but by doing your own research. And you need to do that daily. And you need to unpack your sexism, right? And so he said, um, 
No, but I mean like, how can I like encourage her? <laughs> you know, how can, how can I like, you know, when she's feeling down. So he really didn't want to hear that he was complicit in this problem. He didn't want to hear, you know, he's such a supportive boyfriend. He didn't want to hear that he was part of the problem, right? Um, and so what I'm here to tell you today is that we are all complicit in this problem. And I want to illustrate this um, with the Babadook. How many of you are familiar with this image <laughs> or have seen the movie? Um, I was only able to watch 20 minutes of it before I had to like leave the room. <laughs> it's really, really scary. The Babadook um, is a sort of modern day boogeyman. You know, he lives in the shadows. He's like this really scary, like always lurking in the, in the background, um, kind of imminent, you know. Um, and in our field, we have a boogeyman. We have a Babadook. And that is the external other people who are racist, sexist, ableist, who are causing all these people to leave the field. And you know, we need to make sure that they come to um, Dr. Cabrera Salazar's talk and make sure that they're present and hearing these things. Um, and what we don't realize is that the Babadook is us. And I include myself in that because while I occupy several axes, axes of oppression, I also occupy axes of privilege. And I, um, even though I have um, mental disabilities, I, um, I enact my ableism every day and I have to educate myself and I constantly make mistakes on that. I present as, you know, I'm a cisgendered, cissex, um, straight woman and I misgender people all the time. This is me, you know, someone who's like supposed to be you know, an expert in these things. But I'm not an expert in the sense that you would expect, like with, um, you know, academic knowledge and all these things. I'm not a sociologist. I'm an astronomer, like you. But I am an expert in my lived experience. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And we need to keep in mind throughout this entire talk that if you think I'm not talking to you, I am. Okay? So here are some things that I heard as a graduate student doing my PhD. You're not serious about astronomy. Did you come to grad school to avoid the job market? I came into graduate school the year after the stock market crashed, so this was a very relevant question. And at the time, astronomy was the only thing that I could think of doing with my life. If I didn't get into grad school, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so this question was particularly insulting. All the faculty are concerned about you. When I started graduate school, I was in the city where I had done my undergrad degree, and I had been told graduate school is much better than undergrad. It's like a nine to five job. You know, um, you don't you know, do homework and stuff on the weekends. What people failed to tell me was that that's after your qualifier exam, after you've passed all your classes, right? So I expected something out of graduate school, and nobody told me what they expected of me. And so when I failed to meet the expectations that I had not been you know, told, this is what happened. Everyone's concerned about you. Why can't you do graduate school? Why are you messing up? Um, and that was extremely disheartening. This project is too ambitious. It'll never work. Um, after I was told, you know, everybody's concerned about you. We don't think you're serious about astronomy. I went to work and I was like, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to prove them wrong. Um, and so on the first day of summer, after my first year of graduate school, I yeah, I was reading papers and like taking notes and I had this idea for a project and I took it to my advisor and this is what he said to me. And it totally destroyed uh, my ambition. And uh, it just killed this sense of ownership that I had over this project that I had this idea, you know, my first original idea. And ironically, the project that was too ambitious was the project that I defended um, last year, last November. Um, that I was able to accomplish despite this negativity. You should know this already. When I would ask someone, um, you know, a question, I came from a physics background. I'm a first-generation college student. I don't. I didn't have a path. I had to reinvent the wheel every step of the way. Right. Um, there were gaps in my knowledge, especially in astronomy. I didn't know what the archive was. I didn't know, you know, how to look up abstracts. I had no idea um, about all of these things my colleagues seemed to be just really, like, knowledgeable about. And so I would ask, you know, there, there were some high enough level knowledge things that I did know, but then there were, like, very basic things that I didn't. And so every time I asked a question, this is the response that I got. And you know what my response to this was? I'm not going to ask you questions anymore. Because I can't come to you without feeling 
like, I am not good enough to be here. So I took my questions to other grad students and postdocs who were more friendly, and I luckily had resources that I could um, go to in my department. You pass the qualifier by only two points. Now at this point, <laughs> after taking the qualifier exam, I was like, who gives a shit? <laughs> like, I was like, I don't care if I pass by half a point. I'm done, I never have to worry about this again. But this also is really insidious. Why would you tell a student, your only student of color, right, that this is something that happened? I honestly think, you know, in retrospect, this is to put me in my place. Don't think that, I mean, you just barely got out. Don't think that, you know, you're so great or anything like that. Now, I don't think that people consciously thought this, but that bias is there. It's implicit. It's in our lizard brain. We all know this. The next time you cheat, you will get a zero. In the semester of my qualifier exam, before my qualifier exam, but maybe a couple of weeks before, um, a professor, um, when I walked into class, a professor was just like visibly livid and, and talking about how, um, you know, they had a, a photo of like someone who had like gotten their dissertation revoked for falsifying data. And the professor said, you know, this is the, the end, you know, this is what happens to people who cheat and, and, you know, like, no one should be cheating in my class, this is unacceptable. And I was, I remember thinking like, wow, they're really upset, like, I wonder who cheated, like that's, you know, wow. And then I, you know, they handed the homeworks back and I'm looking through my homework to see what, you know, what I got wrong. And at the end, at the, on the last page, it said this, the next time you cheat, you will get a zero. And the professor said, don't even bother coming to my office, you know who you are, um, I don't want to hear any excuses. You know, and the assumption was that another colleague of mine, a white woman, um, graduate student, had done the homework and that I had cheated off her. Now, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Myers-Briggs personality tests. They might turn out to be total bullshit, but mine is very accurate. I'm an ESFJ, which means that I follow rules very strictly unless those rules do not align with my values, in which case, you know, screw the rules, right? In, when I was 15 in high school, I decided I'm not going to cheat, and that's not who I am. Uh, I believe in like earning things correctly, so I was like, I would never do this. So why is the assumption that I would? You got the NSF because you're a woman and a minority. Now, believe it or not, this was a benevolent sexist comment. Um, they were trying to help me feel better about this somehow um, because they said oh you know the NSF like if you're a woman and a minority they like push your application through so to make sure it gets to the third round so that um, you won't be discriminated against but what I heard was you didn't work hard to earn this this is something that was given to you because of your identity which means I, I don't deserve this like I didn't earn this through my hard work this is from an email <laughs> directly Verbatim, this project has progressed too slowly and without the scientific leadership I like to see in the best and brightest students. In my first year, I applied for a Fulbright. Has anyone here applied for a Fulbright fellowship before? Okay, 1%. <laughs> so you know how difficult it is. It was a six month application process. You think the NSF, GRFP, or like any postdoc applications are bad? This was, you have to find an advisor in some other country who will if in a year and a half you get this money, they will fully support you and they have to write a letter saying these are the resources you're going to have. And I literally cold called people in France um, at 6 a.m. In, um, in our department so that I could use the phone because I didn't have international calling on my phone. And I would just call people, call astronomers over there. Um, and ask them if I could work with them. And I worked so hard. And um, I was in Paris and I asked um, my advisor, you know, I'm here, I should talk to this person who's here at the observatory. Um, what do you think? And this is the response that I got. Um, the response was that I didn't have enough uh, research under my belt, that my project was progressing too slowly, that um, I didn't have anything to contribute to their team, and I should wait another year before I should apply. Maybe you shouldn't publish, it'll only slow you down. Two or three years before I defended my dissertation, I decided, after all of these comments, these add up, you know, they're still there, they're grayed out, but they're still there, right? It's death by a thousand cuts. And every marginalized person in this room knows exactly what this feels like. 
Eventually, what happens, because this builds up, is that it chips away at your desire to do science. It chips away at the work that you loved so much when you first started. And your brain associates the toxic environment with your work. So I started hating my research. I hated going to work every day. I hated going to my lab. Um, and then I said, you know what? I'm done with astronomy. I'm leaving. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And I had this existential crisis about whether I should just leave with my master's or finish my PhD. Can I even tell my advisor? It took me six months to get the courage to say that. Um, and this is the response that I got. And it was helpful, like, you know, I'm trying to help you. You don't want to go into astronomy, you don't want to go into research, so publishing would really only slow you down. And you know what I heard? Your work is not important enough that people will need to see it in the field. This work doesn't need to be published. We don't need to push it. It doesn't even need to be published after your dissertation is written. You're more passionate about baking than you are about astronomy. And this is actually, like, this is taken out of context, but um, my, department, <laughs> my department has a, um, a birthday, like, cake day every month. So everyone whose birthday it is that month, you know, they bring in cake. And my colleague, who was the first person in my department to ever get an NSF GRFP, the Graduate Research Fellowship. Um, she was a person in the department who was in charge of baking the cakes and um, she had started writing her dissertation so she asked me if I could take over and I was like, you know, baking creative cakes at, on my department's dime, sure, why not? Um, but this is the, the association was that like I was being really creative um, in baking these cakes but I, yet I wasn't somehow showing enthusiasm about my work, my astronomy. Um, and I finally said, you know, doesn't it make sense that the first time I brought this idea, right, this, this really great idea I had had, and it was shot down, doesn't it make sense that I wouldn't go to that person anymore? If I were excited about my work, I'm not going to go to that person. I'm going to go to someone who I know will be excited with me, right? But this is the perception that happened. You are not excited about astronomy. I don't see it. So it's clearly not there, right? If you tell people about your experiences, you'll just discourage them. When I decided that I was gonna leave research, I knew, uh, because I started a mentoring program in my department, and it was, you know, it lit a fire under my ass, and this, I was like, this is great, this is like something I'm just as passionate about, and how lucky am I to have a career to look forward to? And I said, you know, I'm going to use my experiences to help other people behind me, um, you know, getting their PhD. And this is what I was told, like, you shouldn't tell them what you went through because you're going to discourage them and they're not going to want to come into the field. And I said, should I lie to them? You know, should I tell people like, hey, it's all good and well here in astronomy and you're going to be great. And then they show up and they think it's going to be great. And when it's not, they internalize that. They think it's my fault that things aren't great. Something is wrong with me, and that's why it's not happening. And that's what happened to me, actually. I'm concerned about your progress, and I'm not the only one. This was when I was writing my dissertation, and someone on my committee, you know, was talking about this. Um, and they said, you know, I'm not the only person on your committee who's concerned about you. This other person on your committee, who, by the way, I had never collaborated with, and they were like an outside person, um, and I had only interacted with them one time, um, you know, this person is concerned about you. And I said, that's really interesting because how could they be concerned about someone that they've never talked to before? Where would they get that idea? You know, did you maybe <laughs> talk to this person and tell them how concerned you were and now that person has that impression? You know, and, and it's funny because when, when we do this, when we are the ones saying, I am concerned and we tell someone else, maybe another faculty, what we're doing is we're spreading this toxic, um, disbelief in another person and usually it's a marginalized person right so be very aware of that you can always push back your defense state this was one week before my defense and there was a problem with my code um, and i didn't i couldn't figure it out but i was super determined and my family was coming in from all over the country to be at my defense um, not my graduation, my defense, because I wanted them to be there for that, because it was important to me, to my community, to my family. And I said, I'm not pushing back this date. And I, and I, you know, I went through it, and I did it, and I, I was able to get everything done, and I submitted my 
dissertation to my committee the Monday and I defended on the Friday, so they were all probably mad at me, but you know, it's still, it happens, so it's fine. You planned a defense reception just for yourself? I did part of my PhD in France, and um, in France, you know, they do PhD defenses very differently than here. Um, you do, uh, the defense part is actually public, which sucks, and I did not want that. Um, but while they're doing the defense, while the, the candidate is doing the defense, their family is setting up another room with food from their region in France or from their country if they're from another country. And then, you know, they kind of, they set up all the champagne and the wine. And then um, after the defense, they bring out the doctoral candidate and they announce them as doctor, you know, so-and-so. And I just thought this is so amazing. Like, I really want this. This is a celebratory day, you know, like, um, it's, it's, it's great. And so I was like, I'm going to plan this reception. Like, no one's going to plan it for me, so I'm going to do it. And my family's going to be here. It's going to be great. They're going to bring, you know, food from Miami. They're bringing croquetas. They're bringing out all this stuff. So, um, and this is the response that I got from a professor in my department. You know, why should you celebrate this? This isn't anything great. Like, you're not accomplishing anything. All you're doing is going from, you know, one thing to another. Like, it doesn't matter. This is not significant. That's what I heard. Make sure you write on the invitation to the department about your reception, regardless of the outcome. So of course, after I heard this, I was like, wait, is there a possibility that I'm not going to pass my defense, right? Because I was pretty sure that the way defenses work is that if you are on the day of your defense and your advisor is standing next to you, that it's because by the end of the day, you're going to be a doctor. And if that's not going to happen, then they push that defense date back and they do not let you defend, right? And that's the impression I was under until I heard this comment and I said, wait, do you really think, is there a possibility that I won't defend? And this person said, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's a committee decision, no one person decides, so, and so there wasn't a clear answer that like, I believe that you will pass and there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that this is not gonna happen. And so of course, days before my defense, I had a lot of self-doubt. So in January of this year, we gave a town hall on racism and astronomy at the AAS meeting. How many of you were there for that? Okay, a good number of you. So one of the things that I did as um, an, an initiative for this town hall is that I pulled uh, people of color in astronomy on Twitter, and I asked them if you um, could fill out this sentence, I wish my white colleagues knew, what would you say? And it was an anonymous survey, so we put this, um, this was a poster that was in the main hall, and we wrote, these are responses from real astronomers of color, some of whom may be at this conference. So this is, even though this is anonymous, all of these responses um, were from people that you know, who are here, who are your colleagues, your friends, you know, your, your students, your advisors, um, and so, and this is, um, they, you know, I'll, I'll this is up online on the Astronomy and Color blog, so I'm not going to read every response to you. But for me, um, personally, it was more about what I wish had happened in grad school so that I could continue to pursue my dream of becoming an astronomer, right? Not just what I wish my white colleagues knew, but what I wish had happened. And so this talk is actually how to retain Nicole Cabrera Salazar in astronomy. Um, and I'm going to go through these with you. Number one, I wish I had been heard. Um, this is really important because a lot of times what happens um, with people of color and very well-meaning white people who are just trying to do their best, right, is that a student of color will, tell, will say something and then the other person will interpret it with their perspective, their lens, and everything even things that they've heard or read about people of color in STEM and, you know, they have all these ideas and they interpret it with that lens. And the dehumanizing thing about that is that I just said something to you, and you are not really listening. You are interpreting what I'm saying, and you are using that and, and actually disadvantaging me, right? And so um, my husband and I has, have been in couples counseling for two and a half years, well before we got married, and um, something that you learn um, in couples counseling, which I think should be called relationship counseling, and everyone should be in it, because it helps you with your relationships and interactions with everyone. But one of the things that we learned was, uh, is called mirroring. Has anyone heard of that here? 
A couple people, all of you should be in couples counseling. Um, so mirroring, the way mirroring works is that a person, um, so this is couples, right? So normally it's like you're in an argument and you go back and forth, but with mirroring, you actually have to stop and you're not listening just to kind of like take notes and like, how am I gonna respond to this when, we're, when they're done talking, right? Um, you actually have to listen and you have to hear what they're saying. And the reason is it's, it's almost like a little pop quiz that you have right at the end of their, you know, sentence or rant or whatever. And so the way you do this is the person tells you something, like they're upset or how they're feeling. And when they're done, you have to say, if I heard you correctly, you feel this way because of X, Y, and Z. And then when you are finished summarizing, you know, you ask, is there more? Did I miss anything? And then if there is, you know, you listen again and then you mirror again. And then when that's done, you say, I think that makes a lot of sense that you feel that way because in the past you've experienced you know, X, Y, and Z and I think it makes sense that now you are um, also feeling that way, right? And then when you're done doing that, you say, I have been in a similar situation before when I felt like you feel and I can relate to that and I empathize with you. That process was never used with me when I was a graduate student. I would try to say things and I would sit down and have these conversations and, and try to explain what it felt like for me. And it was like there was no understanding on the other side. And there was a lot of misinterpretation of what I was saying when really I just wanted to be heard and feel heard. I also wish that I had been believed, right? Like in that instance where I was accused of cheating, I wish that people had believed just believed that this is not something I could do. I wish I had been asked, you know? Um, another story I can tell you is that um, when I was a first or second year graduate student, I was overwhelmed one week with all the things I have to do, you know, as one is wont to do as a graduate student. And um, I said out loud, you know, I wish I could pay someone to grade my labs. And another colleague said, oh, you know, I'll do it. You know, I'll grade your labs for you. And I was like, okay. And like, I was like, I'll pay you, you know, $10 for each section or something like that. And we maybe did this for like a week. Um, and then we both kind of realized like, this is not right. Like we should, probably shouldn't be doing this. And we just stopped on our own. And then we got a couple of weeks later, we got an email from the department chair saying, um, you know, this really stern email saying like, you know, if you're paying people to grade your labs for you, then that's like a really good reason to get expelled from graduate school. And it was addressed to the entire department. It wasn't addressed to me or to grad students. It was addressed to everyone. And so um, no one called me into their office to even ask me if this was true. Um, apparently a professor um, had spread this rumor that it had been going on for months and that this was really insidious and um, just totally unacceptable. And literally no one asked me if it was true, if um, asked me to explain myself, nothing. It was just assumed. Um, and I, if, if they had asked, I don't know if anyone would have believed me about this mistake that I made as a student, you know, God forbid. I wish I had been believed in. I don't know if you know this, but out of three factors that determine a person's science identity, so whether they see themselves as a scientist, there are three. So one is um, the fact that you are actually good at science, the fact that you think you're good at science, and the fact that someone in the community recognizes you as a scientist, they welcome you into the community and you have their approval as a scientist that you are also a scientist. Which factor do you think is the biggest predictor of um, retention in STEM? Number three. So whether you are good at math and science and whether you think you're good at math and science are really not a determining factor as much as someone believing that you are good at math and science. If I had been believed in, I would still be doing astronomy today. I also wish I had been treated like a scientist and not like a nurturing person. How many women have gotten recommendation letters saying like the, how nurturing they are and how caring and they're such a great mentor, right? I know, hand in the back, I see you. Um, I was introduced for my defense as the person who started a graduate mentoring program in my department. And this was days after I had actually compiled a list. Here are all the things that um, 
that I've accomplished that I want to be introduced with. And two of those were winning prize fellowships. So the, not just the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, but also a Chateaubriand Fellowship from the French Embassy um, so that I could do part of my PhD in France. And those things were not mentioned at all when I was introduced in my defense. And what that tells me is that I'm not seen as a scientist, because if I were, these things would be obvious. These would be at the top of the list, right? But they weren't mentioned at all. Um, and so I was not treated as a scientist. I was not welcomed as a scientist. So how could I see myself as a scientist, really? I wish I had met other brown astronomers early on. I didn't meet another Latinx um, astronomer until I was in my fourth year of graduate school. And if I had just known other people like me in the field early on, I would have been able to project myself into this career that I already felt like I don't belong in, um, but I didn't have that experience. And so I, I wasn't able to do that. I wish I had not been so isolated. I don't know if I can convey this feeling. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Get Out? Okay, not enough of you. <laughs> you need to go back and watch that movie because it does a really good job of showing viscerally what it feels like to be bombarded with microaggressions every day. And if you have not seen this movie, it is one of the top movies in the last 10 years, in my humble opinion. Um, I cannot convey what it feels like um, to be so isolated in a space where um, you feel like you don't belong, you feel like you're not doing well enough, um, you feel like nobody accepts you, um, and I didn't have a community either. It wasn't until I met another Latinx astronomer that I realized I, had, I don't have a single Latinx friend in Atlanta. I don't have a single, in the like, almost seven years that I had lived there, I hadn't made a single person. And a lot of that had to do with my environment. My scientific colleagues were all white, and so um, I didn't have another person. Um, to speak to in Spanish, you know, other than my mom on the phone. Um, and so I just, I instantly felt the weight of, oh my God, I don't have a community. I don't have roots here. I wish I had started therapy sooner. Um, I would wager that in my department, over 90% of the graduate students were in therapy. And this is not because of the department, but because graduate school is very stressful. And I tell every single person going into graduate school, on the first day, go to the counseling center because you might not need a counselor now, but you will. Because this is stressful and it's a lot and less than 1% of the world's population have PhDs. That should tell you something about what it is that you're going through that not a lot of people have gone through. Um, and I wish that when I started therapy, I had had a woman of color be my therapist because it's very different having to explain every, not just your pain, but why it's painful to someone than to just say it and the person automatically understands. So I highly encourage you, um, if you're a person of color, to seek out um, a therapist of color. I wish I had had mutual trust with my advisor. That relationship was not a two-way street, as are many advisor and advisee relationships in academia. Um, but when I was a, an undergraduate student at the University of Hawaii for an REU program, my advisor, John Johnson, um, every week we had a meeting and um, he would tell me, you know, like, here's, um, here's what you can improve on. These are the things that you did well. And then he would ask me, what did I do this week? How can I improve? How can I do better? And I told him, okay, <laughs> do you really want to hear it? Here you go. You know, like, this is what I think that you can improve on as my advisor, as, as, as an advisor to me. I never had that in graduate school. And I think that this is something that we really ignore that is super important. It needs to be a two-way street because you are not a person, an expert, imparting knowledge on your students of color. They know themselves better, and they know their journey way better than you ever will, even in the six or seven years that you'll get acquainted with them. Um, and so you need to know how to advise them. And chances are you don't know how to advise anyone, because I don't think any professor gets formal training on how to mentor students in general, and especially not marginalized students at all those intersections, right? So you need to be asking your students, how can I do better? I wish I had felt part of the community. Um, when you don't have, when you don't look like other people and you don't speak like them and you don't have the same experiences as them and you don't have the same financial safety net as them, it can be really, really hard to feel like you belong in a, a scientific community, like a small department. Um, and I had, by the time that I realized um, 
after the Inclusive Astronomy Conference that I had assimilated completely to the environment. I had changed the way that I spoke, um, the, the decibel of my voice, I had changed my mannerisms, I had um, stopped speaking Spanish, mostly because people wouldn't understand me if I started speaking Spanglish, you know, um, at meetings or anything like that. Um, and so I had lost a lot of my identity. And we have to ask, why is it necessary for someone to lose a big part of themselves just so that they can do science. There's a problem there. There's a huge problem, and we need to be acknowledging that. I wish I had learned about social justice sooner, and I will tell you why. The first time that I really engaged uh, in a big way um, with social justice was the year of the Inclusive Astronomy Conference, because I had decided, you know, I'm going to go into um, what I thought was science communication for um, marginalized communities, and so I thought, like, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to go into schools and do things like that, I need to understand the issues that these students face. And so I took a race and ethnic relations class, I started taking sociology classes under the table without my advisor's knowledge, um, and I learned so many things. Um, and then I went to inclusive astronomy and I learned even more, and it was like a slap in the face because I learned that my experiences were not just gendered but racialized. And all of the things that had happened to me, all the things that I had heard, they had these different um, aspects about them that I didn't know. And, and I went into a depression, actually, after that. I had a major depressive episode, and I had to um, stop going to school for four months. I had stopped writing my dissertation, um, and I had to take a, um, a medical leave of absence. And that's how strong this is. That experience, when you are confronted with it, um, it can completely change you psychologically, physiologically. Um, and if I, um, if I had known before I started graduate school that these are phenomena that happen to students of color all over the country, that these are systemic issues, that it's not me, it's not my fault, I would not have internalized all that. But by the time I learned that it was too late. I wish my advisor had tried to truly understand me. This goes back to mirroring, it goes back to having a mutual trust, um, but I really felt that um, a lot of times there's this existential sort of um, argument that you have in your brain. I think a lot of people of color in the room can relate to this, um, where you want to explain to the other person, to your advisor, the one who you're beholden to for this degree, right? You want to explain to them um, what it is you're going through and, and maybe share articles about sexism and racism and implicit bias. But in your head, you're having this like existential crisis of like, if I say that, they're just going to think I'm complaining. They're going to think that I'm not taking responsibility. They're going to think that I'm just whining. Um, and I can't, I can't tell them. Or if I do, it's even worse because I just put myself through all this emotional pain to present this to you and it fell on deaf ears. And I don't, I don't, you don't really care about me. If, even if you say that you do, and yet you're not doing these things that show genuine care, um, then it's not possible. I wish my interactions had been genuine. A lot of people in this field, especially people who are doing equity and inclusion work, know how painful it can be to, um, to make a mistake and hurt someone because of something that they said or something that they did unwittingly. But something that I tell my white husband all the time um, is that I would much rather see you make a mistake and mess up over and over again than to never, to always be perfect with your language and never say anything to offend me or to um, perpetuate my oppression. Because then I know that you're engaged. I know that you're actually doing something and that makes me feel heard and understood. And so I encountered a lot of like, we're never gonna talk about race, we're never gonna talk about gender, we're never gonna talk about ableism, we're never gonna talk about um, you know, sexual minorities and all these different issues. Um, and that erases my experience and the experience of people who don't fit the standard, right? Um, and so if these interactions had been genuine, people would have been messing up all over the place, right? And, um, and we would apologize and move on and, and learn from each other. But people trying to be perfect with their language all of the time and not really doing anything, that's even more painful because th I thought I could trust you and now I know that that's not a real interaction. Does anyone know who this is? This is Jean Bertrand Aristide. He was the president of Haiti, the first democratically elected president of Haiti in 1990. And he has a concept, or he talks about this concept called the third way. And he wrote a lot about globalization and how bad it was for poor people in poor countries. And he said in, in the context of globalization, 
poor people are faced with two choices. Either they succumb to globalization um, and die of exploitation by these measures, or they don't succumb to globalization and they die slowly of starvation. So it's a choice between death and death, and that's not a choice at all. And he was an activist and he um, is still you know, um, actively fighting for the poor in Haiti. Um, and what he said was there has to be a third way. There has to be a different way to approach this. It can't just be these two things. And so what I encourage you to do is to think about ways that, you know, all of these things that I experienced were preventable. And I didn't go into like, okay, how can you turn this around and make sure that your students do have this? But I think that you can, um, I think you can maybe get a little creative and ask your students, talk to them and see, and see how they can be better supported. And um, we have to think about this third way it, doesn't, it might not exist yet because we haven't existed in academic white spaces for a very long time. And so um, we have to create this new path. It doesn't have to be the way that academia is structured. We can think creatively to, um, to leave those confines so that we can support our students of color better. And this is um, an example of how to do this. So this is, um, I was borrowed from my friend Jorge Moreno, who's a professor of astronomy at Pomona College, um, and he's indigenous um, Chicanex. And um, with his students, he had um, a quantum mechanics class that he, um, that he had at Cal Poly Pomona, and he made it a collective class where in his syllabus he wrote, if one person is failing, all of us are failing. And he had mentoring sessions where students who were doing well in the class could tutor the other students who were not doing as well. And he had an extremely high passing rate for a quantum mechanics undergraduate class. So it can definitely be done. Um, this class was an intro astronomy class for non-majors, um, where he had a quiz scheduled every Monday, 20 minutes of the class. And um, he, uh, after the DACA results, um, you know, from the Trump administration, um, this, a lot of the students are Latinx and they were feeling really uh, heavy about this. So he took the time out of his quiz and he said, we're going to have a town hall and we're going um, we're gonna to think about ways that we can improve, improve this classroom and, and our field as well. And that's what they did. And um, his students actually said, you know what, quizzes are not accessible to every person in this room. You know, some people might have test taking anxiety um, and they might not be able to do as well as other students in the room. Some students are not as well prepared, some students are not as privileged. So they actually abolished the, quiz in his, the quizzes in his class. Um, he also believes in doing um, social activities with his students, inviting them to his home um, and you know, having food for them and interacting with them and really getting to know, to know them. Because retaining people of color in astronomy the first thing that we need to notice is that people of color are people. We have so many facets about us that are different, and um, this is the key to understanding us, is to spend time with us and to really genuinely care about us and our families and, and our cultures. Okay, so you might be a little bit mad at me <laughs> if you've heard this, you know, this presentation, um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to make an analogy. Um, and let's say you have this house. It's a really beautiful cottage, but it's an older house and it has a few problems. And so you, um, you contract a plumber to come in and check your plumbing. And they say, you know what? Your plumbing is completely rotten. You have to replace the whole thing. You have to tear down the walls. You have to go in and do all this stuff. You wouldn't tell the plumber, you know what? This house has been standing for a long time and we're just not gonna change it. And, um, we're not gonna, that's too much money. We're not gonna invest um, in a new plumbing system. You know, why would we do that? Um, you would say, you know what, like this sucks. I'm gonna call my insurance and make sure that they cover this and we're gonna invest in this because do you know what happens? The value of your house will go up. But first you have to live through the renovations and you have to maybe live out of a tiny corner of your house and you have to um, cook in your microwave because you're not your stove and, and everything is not available. If anyone has ever gone through renovations, they are the worst. Um, but it's a really good analogy for this. We have a problem in this field and this culture is not inclusive of everyone, right? Um, and I'm the plumber coming to tell you that your plumbing is rotten and it needs to be replaced. And you have to invest money and time and effort to get it to, get it to the right place. But once you do, you're going to add value. 
You're going to add value to your institutions, your department. Um, you're going to be lauded, actually, for being the first progressive, you know, um, inclusive space for these students. Um, and so really, replacing the plumbing ultimately benefits you as well, not just um, the, the people that you think it's going to be benefiting. I'm going to leave you with this last slide, and I'm going to ask you to shout out what you think this photo is of. OK, a mosque. Anybody else have any guesses? A house, OK. This is the oldest university in the world. It's al Karouin University, and it's in Fez, Morocco, and it was started by a black woman named Fatima Alfira. And so a lot of times, students of color, and people of color in general in academia, in, um, we come into these white spaces, these white institutions, and we get the message that we don't belong here, and we're not, you know, we're not made to be here, and we, um, you know, we have to make special accommodations for you to even be here, but the truth is that the idea for a center of learning that has been standing for longer than most of the buildings built by so-called Western civiliz civilizations, um, this was an idea that a black woman had. And there are buildings that are still standing that our ancestors built. Um, and I just want to say, this is a testament to us coming into these walls with our own knowledge and our own experiences. And we enrich this science and astronomy with that. And we're still here and we're still standing. I got my PhD. You know, I defended last year despite all of the negativity that I experienced. Um, and I'm still, I still have my foot in the door in astronomy. I'm here. I work with the American Astronomical Society. I really, um, I have a heart for students um, in astronomy. And so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. In the end, you know, I'm still here and so are you. Thank you. While this warms up, uh, we have time for some questions. Questions in the audience? Um, I just want to say um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Do you think um, there's a conflict between wanting to be heard and the exhaustion of trying to get someone to understand your point? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, I absolutely feel like there's this conflict between like I want I want someone to understand so that I can continue doing this work and and they can um, we can have this mutual understanding. But then there's of course like putting yourself through the emotional labor of of doing that is a lot. You have to relive the pain of the original. Um, you know, infraction, and you have to explain it to someone who doesn't understand, and that is exhausting emotionally, especially when you have to carry all of those microaggressions with you. So absolutely, um, a lot of times I felt like I had to make a decision. Either I sit down and I have this really difficult conversation that's going to exhaust me in every sense, um, and it may or may not be understood, or I say nothing, and pretend like things are okay, and keep my head down, and just go along, go along with it, but let it eat, it, eat me up inside, you know? So that's a really difficult decision to make, and we have to acknowledge that other people don't have to make that choice, and those are mental processors in your brain that are not being used for science. Other questions? I have a question, um, two important aspects we have to have to retain you in astronomy. Uh, so you mentioned um, it's important to have a sense of community, to have a space where you are with others who have gone through like experiences. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you said at the end that it's also very important to have genuine interactions. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, when we are trying to balance the right mix of safe spaces mm -hmm. versus you know, being able to talk to people who may not know as much but with whom we need to have that conversation because
because it's a learning curve for them as well. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you, um, I don't know if you want to make a recommendation, but, but what advice would you give to those of us who are kind of trying to balance these mm -hmm. two different needs? I can tell you what I would do. And I would not try to balance those needs because there are very separate needs, right? Um, if you have two children and one of them loves watching television and the other one loves playing sports, do you discipline them in the same way? Do you take away the same things? No, because they're two different people who have different needs and different values, right? So I would say what I would do in that situation is stop trying to Ma balance everyone's needs because number one it's not a level playing field so everyone doesn't come in with the same privilege and access and emotional capacity right so I would say like there does need to be a space where people can feel safe and that they can talk about the things that they need to say without the emotional burden of explaining to other people why it even exists and there should be a space where people feel safe making mistakes and, um, and learning about these things. And someone who does not have the emotional burden of, of carrying these microaggressions every day can be the person there, you know, holding people's hands and, and teaching them um, and everything. But those two things can be kept separate. Um, and it's very important to know that um, we don't have to, if we appease you know, the average, you're gonna leave marginalized people completely out of it. And that's not what we wanna do. Thanks. You've gone through all this because basically you love astronomy mm -hmm. and you got your PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, makes me proud of you. Thank you. Um, but how do you reconcile that now? I mean, what do you mean? I mean, how do you how do you keep your love of astronomy beating in your heart <laughs> after all you've been through? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so the question is, how do, I, how do I maintain my love for astronomy after what I've been through? I'm gonna be very honest with you. Um, I currently, like right now, it's, and this is all very fresh because I just graduated you know, in May. Um, whenever people, they know that I'm in astronomy and they'll come and they'll say, hey, look at this um, great discovery. Did you hear about this? And in my head, I'll just say, I literally don't care. I don't care. I don't want to hear about new discoveries. I don't want to, you know, because I'm not at the point where I've processed my emotions enough in therapy to be at the point where I can disassociate my work and my research and astronomy, the field, and all of my negative experiences. I'm not there yet. I want to be, and I, I know it's possible because other people who are farther along than me have shown me that it is possible, that they have gone through it, but it, I need the space and the time to really process and disassociate those two things. But um, nevertheless, you can say it and mean it that you love astronomy. Right now, <laughs> I, love, I love the field, I love yeah. the people, I, I want, people to succeed. I don't want people to go through what I went through, and I'm here for them. Um, but right now, as far as you know, astronomy, the research, I can't say that I do. I am working on that, and I'm, I'm really trying to get to that point um, for myself, but I'm not there yet, honestly. So it, it will take some time. In spite of all you've been through. It, In fact, it's because of all I've been yeah, through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so that's the damage, and we really need to be careful about this. That's the damage that it can inflict on someone to take away their passion and their love for something with these little things that you cannot quite put your finger on, but they have that additive effect. Yeah. All right, let's thank Dr. Nicole.